colleagues, when I was foreign minister, I used to say only half facetiously that Canada had two, re two relationships in the world. One was with the United States, the one was with the rest of the world. Where so much of the trade that Canada does is across the Canada-US border and where we share so much with each other. Maintaining a strong and fruitful relationship between our two countries is absolutely critical to the, the best interests of Canada itself and I believe to the United States as well. Ambassador, let, let me start by saying that we would be grateful, we are grateful to have any ambassador from the United States to Canada because uh, there was a long drought where, where the U.S. was not represented here. But we're particularly grateful to have one who has a long experience both in politics and in, in business, who understands the realities of business and who is so passionately committed to the bilateral relationship. Uh, you've really hit the ground running. You've been across the country. You've done an enormous amount of outreach. And we're delighted to have you here today at the Canadian Chamber. Well, thank you very much, Perrin. You were one of my first meetings, albeit virtually, as you will, as you will recall. Um, and this is a fantastic country. I mean, it is a big country. It is, there are complicated issues, but um, as President Biden has said, there is no better friend of the United States anywhere in the world than Canada. And it's really an honor for me to represent the president's interests in, in nurturing and growing and maintaining that special relationship between Canada and the United States. Let's talk about that relationship. We're at a critical time in world history in so many ways. A brutal war in Europe, pressures from, uh, from China in so many areas, North Korea, COVID hasn't left us fully. The United States, in providing international leadership, finds itself under challenge in so many different ways. Talk about the role of the Canada-US relationship. How do you see it? What could we be doing better than we're doing? What does the United States want to see out of the relationship? So you've teed up the question in the absolute perfect way. I mean, I couldn't be prouder um, to be an American and to be a friend of Joe Biden's because I think the United States and Joe Biden have demonstrated uncommon leadership in, this, in these difficult times, rallying the world's democracies together to take on autocracies in Russia um, and China and being a stabilizing influence in the world economy. But Canada's been the most important ally and friend that we've had in those efforts. And um, you, can't, you can't identify an issue that the United States and Joe Biden have led on where Canada has not been right there with the United States, helping to lead. And, you know, we're, we recognize this. We're the 800-pound gorilla, and we can't always be the leader on everything or else People may get tired, they may rebel. We need other allies to step up and to lead, and Canada has just been terrific at assuming that role in numerous occasions. So I'll just give you one example, um, and that is on the Declaration Against Arbitrary Detention, which was a Canadian-led effort, and in the, in the, in the scheme of, of the United States and Canada and the world's democracies, standing for values-driven principled positions. A position against um, arbitrary detention is as principled and as democratic as anything out there, and Canada led on that initiative and has done a marvelous job, and frankly, a better job than the United States could have done um, because, you know, because of our, you know, there's a limit to how many times one country can go to the well. And so that, that's just one example, but there are many examples, the leadership that Canada has provided um, and the connection with sanctions um, against Russia, um, the, the leadership that um, Canada and Christian Freeland has played in on world economic matters, the leadership that Canada has played um, around, the, uh, around energy security um, and the reaction to um, Russia's weaponization of oil and of energy. These are all places where Canada has just been an indispensable ally and leader, and I think that is the relationship that the United States treasures so much about our Canada relationship. Let's bring it down to the business relationship between our two countries. Uh, for the Canadian business community, 
that the U.S. market is obviously the single most important market that there is, both as a supplier and as a market for us to, to sell to. What is the attitude in Washington these days with regard to the business relationship with Canada? Uh, for example, as you do major new spending on infrastructure and the like, and as you look at other elements of American, of American policy, is the policy by America or by North American? So you and I have had a chance to talk about this before, and I'm, gonna, I'm, a, you know, I'm a former quasi-journalist. I, mean, I was an executive um, in a company that had arguably the world's largest media company in NBC News, M NBC, MSNBC, et cetera. So I, I understand what it means when you say you don't bury the lead. So I don't want to bury the lead. Our relationship at $2.6 billion a day in trade across the border is generating millions of jobs on both sides of the border and where more than 30 United States states count Canada as their largest export destination. Um, that it, Canada is the number one trading partner of the United States. It's also true, as you say, that, that for Canada, the United States is its number one trading partner. So with all the the potential disagreements, what some people refer to as irritants. I don't really like that term because for the industry involved, it's not an irritant. It could be the difference of life and death. But for all of those issues, it all has to be viewed against the context of this extraordinary trade and financial relationship. And I think that relationship is very much appreciated by the United States. It's very much valued by the United States. I don't think you can, you can take an entire trade relationship and say, is it by American or is it by North American? Um, I think you know, the United States survives, thrives, and competes on a largely free and open trading relationship, and I think that has been the case with Canada too. The concept of by America and by American, let's remember, only applies to federal procurement has nothing to do with the private sector economy, and the, which is the lifeblood of the economy for both Canada and the United States. And I think the United States, like almost every other country in the world, including Canada, has times when for federal procurement, for governmental procurement, they will build, there will be an interest in building certain advantages in for American manufacturers and producers. Canada has a provision to do this and in fact used that provision around COVID related procurement um, implicating the so-called national security exemption and cutting American manufacturers out of that federal procurement. So it, this is a reality of the way in which governments procure products and services. But the overwhelming friendship and importance of the U.S.-Canada relationship has always led to a disproportionate number and examples of waivers or carve-ins or carve-outs for Canada. Happened in the Infrastructure Act under the Obama administration and, um, and, it, happened, and it has happened again um, in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act sort of been lost in Canada, the Department of Transportation, which is the major administrator of those funds, um, uh, put in place a six-month waiver of the Buy American provisions in that, in that act, and Canada is likely to be the largest beneficiary, Canadian businesses likely to be the largest beneficiary of that waiver, and then more importantly are the um, EV tax credit provisions, which were finally passed as part of the Inflation Reduction Act, which is an explicit by North American strategy and a by North American program. And you can tell the you can tell that the world has noticed since so many of the United States other allies are upset about that provision and are now threatening to challenge it as being violative of of um, World Trade Organization uh, principles and and don't like that principle. So that's a long way to answer the question that, um, that there's an overall bias to making sure that, um, that the, our borders and our trade is open to Canada. 
and to Mexico for that matter, but to North America. Um, and that doesn't mean that there'll never be a, a Buy American provision in a limited nature of federal procurement by way of example, but the overall bias is to nurture and to grow this tremendous commercial relationship that exists between our two countries. That is known, that is appreciated, um, and that is expected. Can we, can we talk about the relationship on energy, specifically oil and gas? Yep. A sore point for Canadians, as you're well aware, was the decision very early in President Biden's term to cancel the Keystone XL pipeline. The situation in the world has changed dramatically since then as a result of, of the brutal war being waged by, by Russia in Europe. Um, we've seen shortages of energy. It'll be a long, cold winter in, in uh, Europe. We've seen energy prices going up at the pumps. The, the president has freed up supplies from the, from the reserve to try to bring down prices. Has the situation changed to the point where it makes sense for Canada and the U.S. to have a joint strategy with regard to oil and gas to ensure that, that, that the United States is able to supply, to get its international supplies from a democracy with high standards of, of environmental protection and protection of human rights? So the world has changed. There's no doubt about that. I don't think the world has changed in a sufficient respect that any of the decisions that have been made would be made differently today than they were made at the time that they were made. And I, again, I want to start, I don't want to bury the lead, but um, as Mike said in his, in, in his introduction, um, the United States and Canada enjoy not only the largest trade relationship, but the largest energy trading relationship of either of their, of, of in, in either company. So the United States imports 68% of its oil from Canada. And almost all of that, 98%, is from Alberta. So this is not some trifling relationship. I mean, we have an enormous and significant energy trading relationship with Canada. And I, as part of my travel, I've been to the oil sands. I've, I've seen what an, an incredibly impressive operation there is and understand the tremendous capacity that comes from that. But I also went to Atlantic Canada and learned about the significant offshore oil production that is happening in Atlantic Canada, married, by the way, with wind and solar, which are, which are cleaner energy sources. Um, I've also had the chance to go to James Bay and visit the Hydro-Quebec, um, incredibly impressive hydro facilities in James Bay, and one of my most fascinating little factoids that I've picked up in my travel is that the new James Bay um, power line project, when completed, will supply 20% of the electrical energy for New York City. And that is a two-way energy trading relationship because it, the, the infrastructure that's being built provides capacity for the United States to sell energy back, hydropower energy, back to Canada when the balance is right. I've also learned that there is a significant hydro power relationship in Manitoba coming down to the United States, 250 megawatts of electricity coming down from Canada to Manitoba, and that is also a two-way relationship. And it's, it's a little ironic to me that it's in the winter when the when the pricing and the balance works for the United States to be selling power back to Canada. Um, and, then, and then we have um, Columbia River, Columbia River Basin, and the significant amounts of hydropower and hydropower trading that are occurring there. And I give you those examples because the future of our energy trading relationship is likely to be different than it is, than it was five years ago. This, I mean, there might be some people get upset with me for saying this, but we're not going to eliminate our reliance on fossil fuels. I mean, there's always going to be a significant fossil fuel market, and the, and the United States will have a significant fossil fuel energy trading relationship with Canada. But the future of energy is going to be a more diversified um, future, one where there are cleaner energy sources as we take on the need to attack climate change, 
which is a mutual goal of Canada and the United States, and as we deal with energy security issues. Because the, one of the many nice things about hydropower, for example, in addition to being a clean energy source, is that it is not controlled by autocracies like Russia or Belarus or, um, or China. These are energy sources that are uniquely within our control, and as we transition and become less reliant on fossil fuels and more reliant on clean energy sources that we control in North America, our energy security um, and our national security will be improved. Great. <coughs> Colleagues, just a reminder to you that if you have questions you'd like to put to Ambassador Cohen, uh, please submit them through Slido, and in about five minutes or so, uh, we'll take the questions from the floor. Um, Ambassador, let's talk about the about the border. I understand you were recently in Detroit, Windsor, and you had a chance to to see the Gordie Howe Bridge, as well as the Ambassador Bridge. and the Ambassador Bridge. It, it was a two bridge visit. It was a two, two bridge visit. It is this is the most important border crossing in North America. Um, it really is symbolic of three hundred million dollars a day, which is staggering. Of, when you think I about mean, that. think in one border crossing three hundred million dollars a day between the two borders. And it symbolizes the deep integration of our economies Correct. with each other, where a seat can be produced on one side of the border for an automobile and the chassis on the yep. other side, and they match up in real time. Uh, are there things that we can be doing to expedite and to make the, to expedite crossing the border and to reduce costs at the border and to make it uh, more transparent for legitimate commerce and uh, honest travelers to be able to, to cross? Well, I'll say this. I mean, I think the Gordie Howe Bridge is an important infrastructure project that accomplishes just that. And I know there may have been some controversy, but I mean, I've been assured, I asked this question, there is fortunately plenty of traffic to support a busy and profitable Ambassador Bridge and Gordie Howe uh, Bridge. And it's just more capacity that will enable us to have a more secure and a more robust supply chain crossing, crossing the border, and more efficient as well. And I look, I think in the wake of, of the pandemic and the, and the receding of the pandemic, um, I think we have been focused on making the border more seamless and making it easier, um, more efficient, and less expensive with less friction for, for freight, for cargo, um, and for human beings to be able to freely cross the border. And we'll continue to work on that. I mean, I think, you know, we're in a post-911 world. There's going to be more security than there, you know, than there was 20 or 30 years ago. But I think we've done a lot of work, both countries, at making the border as seamless as possible while respecting the needs for security. You won't, I know that you anticipate the next, uh, the next question that I have for you, but let me put a question on the floor first. Uh, how many of us here have Nexus cards? Can you put your hands up? Which are so important both for domestic travel in Canada and obviously for crossing borders as well. Uh, yesterday, so by the way, not to be provocative, but if I were in an American audience and asked how many people had Nexus cards, there would have been a substantially smaller showing of absolutely. hands. Absolutely. About 80% of the members of Nexus or Canadian. Absolutely. It's really primarily a Canadian program. And it, it certainly reflects the fact that 90% of the Canadian population lives within 100 miles of the U.S. Yep. border. 90% of the U.S. population lives more than 100 miles from the Canadian yep. border. So it is, there's no question that it's of, uh, of great advantage to Canadians. Um, you'll be aware of the fact that yesterday in Washington, your counterpart, the Canadian ambassador to the United States, was speaking about Nexus, and she said that the U.S. government is holding the Nexus program hostage. Have you a response to that? So um, what I'd like to do, as opposed to responding, because I have enormous respect for Ambassador Hillman, what I'd like to do is take the opportunity, which I had a chance once with you privately, to, to give the facts around the Nexus program, what's really going on here, and to clarify that. So first of all, I will say, notwithstanding the fact that 80% of the customers of Nexus are Canadian, Nexus is a program that we value for the reasons that you said in your prior question. We want it to be easier 
and easy as possible for people to close the border. So our Department of Homeland Security, which is responsible for administering the border, and Secretary Mayorkas are strong supporters of Nexus and want to see Nexus work. But here are the facts, and it's really important, which is for many years, there's no news here from our perspective, but for many years, the United States has made clear to Canada that our CBP agents, Customers and Border Patrol agents who do, who work in the Nexus centers, need to have the same standard basic legal protections that CBP agents who do preclearance work in Canada have. And by the way, that our CBP agents around the world have. We, we do, the CBP agents do preclearance in five other countries in addition to Canada and everywhere those CBP agents have a basic set of legal protections. CBP agents doing nexus work have not had that, those basic legal protections. The United States said, starting in 2015 at least, that we needed to correct that. So this is not some new dispute. It's not renegotiating an agreement because we don't have an agreement that covers. But when we close the nexus centers, because of the pandemic, we unambiguously told the Canadian government that we would not reopen them unless our CBP agents were afforded the same basic legal protections as our CBP agents who were doing preclearance work. By the way, many of those CBP agents are the same people. One day they may be doing preclearance work, one day they may be doing nexus work, and we're trying to look out for our CBP agents make sure that they have basic legal protections. That is what this is about. And the solution to this problem is wholly within Canada's control. Um, that is, they can extend those same legal protections to all CBP agents, regardless of whether they're doing nexus work or preclearance work. Now, there, there's been some hang up as to whether it's hard or easy to do this. I honestly don't know the answer to that, but it doesn't make any difference whether it's hard or easy. Um, Canada's had years to be able to think about this. We're not dictating how Canada solves this problem, but, we're, but the fact is that this is a problem that is within Canada's control to solve. And if, it's as Im if Nexus is as important to Canada as Canada says that it is, then it might be worth a little effort and doing something hard to be able to solve this problem. In the meantime, the United States has not sat idle. We have tried to implement what we can implement in order to reduce backlogs and to keep the Nexus system operating. So first and foremost, we're spending millions of dollars on additional hours for CBP agents in the United States to process Nexus applications to try and deal with the backlog. We have offered to extend Nexus membership for five years so that we at least buy some time um, as Canada works to as Canada works to solve this problem. Um, we are we probably by the way the Prime Minister said this on Thursday. We acknowledge that this is an issue that involves high level discussions on almost a daily basis between the right people in Canada and the right people in the United States. I've been involved in some of those discussions, um, but Secretary Mayorkas and Minister Mendicino have talked frequently about this, and we're exchanging ideas. And one idea is to, um, is to do this virtually mm -hmm. as opposed to in person. There are some legal issues with that. Um, this, the the um, Nexus, the statute that authorizes Nexus requires on its face in-person interviews. But we have told Canada we will look at that, we will see whether there is a way around it, and we're in the process of doing that. So the United States has extended itself to try and find ways to reduce the backlog, to make this system work. We are committed to the program, but it is going to require, the long-run solution will require Canada to extend those basic legal protections to our CBP agents doing nexus work, not more, but identical to the 
protections that the CBP agents, as I said, often the same CBP agents, one day they might be doing preclearance, one day they might be doing nexus work. So it's nothing extraordinary, and it's the same set of legal protections that are available to CBP agents in five other countries around the world. One other very quick question before we go to the questions from the floor. This is the off-year elections coming up in a couple of weeks' time. What should the Canadian business community be looking for in these elections? What are the potential impacts economically and particularly in, in terms of the bilateral business relationship between Canada and the United States? So, um, as, you, as you observed in the intro, I've been very involved in politics, but I've had to learn as a United States ambassador and try, to try not to talk like a political consultant and, um, get in, and get too deeply into politics. Um, I, look, I remind everyone that there's a rhythm in the United States midterm elections. Um, in every election since the 1940s, every midterm election since the 1940s, the party in power in the White House has lost seats in the House, and in most of those elections, um, they've lost seats in the Senate as well. So there's a rhythm where I think you can expect a pickup of Republican seats in the House maybe in the Senate, maybe not. I think it'll be much closer in the Senate. So I wouldn't, I mean, unless there's a dramatic pickup of 30, 40 seats in the House, I don't think you can take much, I don't think you can take much from that, from that pattern. As a business person, U.S. or Canadian, I'm not going to be very worried about what happens in the midterms, again, because I think it's going to be well within the pattern of what normally happens in midterms. Um, and more importantly than that, no matter what happens in the midterms, Joe Biden will be president of the United States for at least another two years. And so I don't think even the House and or Senate going Republican is going to fundamentally change trade policy or foreign policy toward Canada because those policies are much more controlled by the White House and the president than they are by the Congress. Um, but I've learned Canadians pay a lot of attention to politics in America. By the way, a lot more attention than Americans pay to politics in Canada. And you, you do have to look at the outcome of the elections and see whether there's a trend line that would carry forward into 2026 and might relate to the 26 elections, including the presidential elections. And that's really going to depend upon what the results look like um, and in particular what the results look like in six to ten swing states that tend to decide presidential elections. We're just about out of time, but we'll try to squeeze in two more questions. Okay, that's okay. I'll be from, shorter. From the floor, uh, I, by coincidence, uh, Charles from the FCCQ asked exactly the same question on Slido. As, okay. Uh, so I just asked you. So let's go to, um, to Kelly uh, Hollihan, who asked what lessons were learned during the COVID-19 pandemic about cross-border trade and commercial activity, and what action is being taken? So, um, I, different people may have different opinions about that. Um, I, my own opinion is that we, that Canada and the United States learned the importance of following science in making those decisions. A pandemic is not something to politicize. Um, and governments, responsible governments, need to make the best possible decisions to protect their populations from being infected and from being hospitalized and from dying. And I think both countries drew an appropriate balance. It may have seemed tough at the time, but drew an appropriate balance and were successful not in eliminating hospitalizations, not in eliminating deaths. I mean, we had hundreds of thousands of people die, but I think we limited the damage overall from a health perspective. It created a lot of disruption on the trade side, but you, I don't know how, I don't know what the price is you can put on a human life. And so I'm pretty proud of the balance that the United States demonstrated through the pandemic, and I think Canada demonstrated a similar balance. I think the Although you're right when you commented that we're not free of the pandemic, I do think that the 
that the number one breakthrough in the pandemic were the development of mRNA vaccines, which have undoubtedly reduced the severity of cases of COVID. Um, they, they haven't wiped out COVID, but um, I think COVID is a lot less scary than it is now and than it was at the time of the height of the pandemic. And that allows for more flexible policies that allow for more open borders and, you know, things like making a Rive Can optional, um, as, as Canada has done, making it a little bit, making it easier to cross the border. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, it's um, even though medicine is science, and I said we, our success was we learned to follow the science, science is not necessarily precise. I mean, there are some fine tuning of the knobs and I think we've learned how to use the knobs to fine tune and not to overreact to, um, to level of disease, especially when it is not as, as dangerous as it was at the height of the pandemic. Thank you. The final question was from Trevor McPherson from the Mississauga Board of Trade who says, it's no question that for businesses these days, the number one challenge is talent. Given our close bilateral relationship, do you see opportunities to work together on this critical issue for our shared economy, economic recovery, and future growth? So I, by the way, just want to second the motion. I, as I've traveled this country and as I've talked with my former colleagues in the business community in the United States, number one issue on both sides of the border is talent. Finding it, training it, retaining it, promoting it. Um, and I do think there are opportunities to work together, and I think we are working together um, on the issue. And, uh, but it is, it's not like we have an abundance of talent on one side of the border, and therefore we can work together to spread that talent. We've got a shortage of talent on both sides of the border, and so I think what you're seeing is working together on training, on facilitating cross-border trade, which may cross-border employment, which may, may make employment in North America more attractive and more palatable, and therefore easier to attract talent into jobs on both sides of the border. Ambassador, thank you so much. Um, your candor today, your, your directness, the engagement that you've shown with the Canadian business community, the efforts you've made to get across, you've seen more of Canada than most Canadians have seen <laughs> in the short time that you've been here. Well, my wife tells me I've seen more of Canada in the year that I've been here than I've seen in the United States in the 65 plus years I've lived in the United States. So. I, I thought you were going to say that you've, you've seen more of Canada than you have of her in the last while since coming. <laughs> that is also true, but she's used to that. <laughs> well, we are, we're delighted. We're grateful to you for your work. We are very fortunate in Canada because of this bilateral relationship and because historically presidents have chosen someone in, in whom they have strong personal confidence. And that means in many ways we have two, um, two Canadian ambassadors to the United States, one, one stationed in Washington, the other in Ottawa arguing right. for this bilateral relationship, right. and you have certainly been doing that. Well, thank you, Perrin. Thank you personally. I want to thank the Chamber, um, which uh, one of the neat things about my travel in Canada, whenever I see businesses, they're virtually always members of the chamber. So I feel, I feel that I've had a lot of contact with your membership and it's always illuminating. And as a former member of, um, of the Greater Philadelphia Chamber of Commerce, I understand the value of chambers of commerce and um, this chamber that you lead is um, one of the best. I mean, the, the connectivity you provide for your members, the service you provide for your members, the advocacy you provide for the business community in general is extraordinary and it's just been a pleasure to interact with you and the chamber um, throughout my stay in Canada. Thanks Ambassador and uh, in the uh, please do applaud him at this point. Well, applaud the chamber and parent.